Tales from the Crypt Season 2 starts out incredibly strong with the premiere episode, Dead Right. The plot sees Kathy, a woman who wants a rich and successful life, and fast. She visits a medium who tells her she will meet a man who will inherit a lot of money and then die in a violent way soon after. When she meets grossly overweight Charlie, who informs her of his rich relatives, she promptly marries him. As it turns out, the medium is always right. Now, not to beat a rotting horse, but this is a much better first episode to kick off the season than The Man Who Was Death. Dead Right is an episode that made a big impression on me, but also one that I had not seen in a while. And damn, it's a wild one. The makeup is really something to behold. And frankly, it looks just as good as Colin Farrell's penguin makeup only decades later. The next thing is, despite this being very fat phobic, there is enough humor to kind of balance things out. Plus, Charlie is certainly a sleazy asshole, so it's hard to really feel sorry for him. This episode would also carry on an interesting theme, this overt war of the sexes. If it's not a man slash woman scheming their partner out of their money, it's jealousy or adultery that rears its ugly and often deadly head. Now, I get it. The show was not meant to be binge watched, but it was interesting watching these episodes back to back and seeing this very strong thematic through line yet this season is awesome and it does offer a nice buffet of horror in fact some of my favorite episodes in the entire series are featured in this season the plot, Reno and Sam are a pair of hardcore gamblers who don't play for fun. They challenge each other in a simple game of cards and the end result could be a lot deadlier than what they've bargained for. Above, I mentioned that, especially in the first half of the season, there's a certain through line of screwing over loved ones, be it wife or husband or someone you're dating. Oftentimes the end game is money, but sometimes it's power and control. Cutting cards is an interesting variation on the toxic relationship episode. Now, hear me out. While on the surface, Reno and Sam are rivals to the extremist extreme, they also, in a strange way, kind of feel like bitter exes. And I have to wonder if this wasn't done on purpose. After all, there was no way in hell they were going to feature a queer character on Tales from the Crypt. So, therefore, it's my headcanon that they are a weird kind of couple. This episode takes a very simple premise, yet thanks to some very clever writing, really makes a ham dinner out of things. As the episode further slides into insanity, it's so utterly fun to watch. Side note, I got to meet Lance Hendrickson, and he was among the nicest celebrities you would ever want to meet, so if you ever get that chance, definitely take it. Both actors understand the assignment, and there is a reason why this is a very highly rated episode. Also, when I look back at episodes of Tales from the Crypt that left a huge impact on me, the ventriloquist dummy is definitely one of them. The plot, amateur ventriloquist Billy Goldman learns that being a ventriloquist might not be the best career for him. Seriously, this episode gave me the creeps as a kid and rewatching it, it still holds up extremely well. The episode harkens back to anthologies like Dead of Night, but also movies that are more psychologically driven like magic. Yet Richard Donner adds a morbid, magical touch that makes us feel wholly original and unforgettable. Indeed, as I said, it left a big mark on me as a horror fan. Side note, holy crap, I forgot just how zany this episode is at times, but it does balance out some of the more disturbing implications brought up in the episode. Maybe the crown jewel of this season is television terror with an impressive 8.0 on IMBD. The plot sees a TV shock jock journalist give an on-air tour of an eerie haunted house. And of course, in true crypt fashion, he gets more than he bargains for. It might shock you to learn that out of all 93 episodes of Crypt, there has never 
been one devoted to Halloween, which, you know, is kind of wild to think about. However, television terror might be the closest we get to that, at least from a vibe perspective. The big hook of this episode is it stars Morton Downey Jr. You may be wondering, who is that? So this one needs a little context going in. Many of you have never heard of Morton Downey Jr. and that's probably for the best. He was famous or rather infamous for having a tasteless talk show. Think Jerry Springer, but just way more morally bankrupt. Not sure if I can play any clips due to copyright and also just because as frankly, going through those clips would be mentally draining. But here's an image that they used on his Wikipedia page, which should give you a pretty good idea of what he was famous for. Also, in case you're wondering, no, he's not related to Robert Downey Jr. Television Terror is a bit of a slow burn, but patience is rewarded with what feels like a trip through a spooky house attraction, only with tons of gore. Not only are the horror elements very enjoyable, but there's a really interesting meta textual element at play, seeing how Morton is basically playing a version of himself and his show. But what's probably more interesting is it's not lost on the audience and hell, probably not even Morton himself that seeing him die violently at the end would likely be oh so satisfying for a lot of people in real life. However, the meta-ness doesn't end there as we get a funny reference to Al Capone's vault, which if you didn't know was a infamous live TV blunder, Google it. The commentary on the cutthroat media landscape and the model of if it bleeds, it leads, is used to its most cynical and brutal conclusion. The end result is a funny, spooky episode with a message, but it doesn't feel preachy. The blending of episode footage and the show within the show is utilized very well, giving it a found footage horror quality. This is an excellent episode, and not only a season highlight, but a series one. Okay, so now for some honorable mentions. The episode Three is a Crowd starts off as a standard jealousy episode, but has one of those holy shit endings. Like, it just kind of blew my mind. It's so darkly funny, but at the same time, very tragic. Speaking of endings, the sacrifice doesn't give the villains a fitting comeuppance, making it among the darkest and most cynical of the entire series. Mute Witness to Murder gives us the rare example of a great couple that actually really love each other but has something terrible happen to them from outside of the marriage. Also, making John Boy Walton a pill-popping psycho is just mwah, chef's kiss. Then you have very strange and even poetic outings like Four-Sided Triangle, which feels like it was referenced in Pearl. I mean, I cannot be the only one that thinks that. Corman's Calamity is a fun meta episode about a Tales from the Crypt comic artist. Then you have, of course, Lower Birth, which tells the origins of the Crypt Keeper, which is a very fun little episode. I would also be remiss in not giving a quick mention to For Crying Out Loud for just being a great zany plot, plus cameos from Iggy Pop and the late Sam Kennison, and a pre-Futurama but post Married with Children Katie Seagal. In the first part, I talked about this show having amazingly quirky character actors and Carol Kane being totally bonkers in Judy, You're Not Yourself Today is just a thing of beauty. Fitting Punishment is a rare episode that features an all black cast and point of view. This is great and also it's such a nice departure story wise from the jilted lovers that litter the front portion of the season. Overall, despite some of the episodes feeling a little bit samey in terms of plot and theme, season two is truly where Tales from the Crypt finds a nice balance in its tone. The mixture of humor and horror is not perfect, but handled extremely well. In terms of fans, this season has among the highest rated episodes according to IMBD. I'm happy to report that this is not where the series peaks and going forward there will be more standout episodes. Certainly this reaches some very high highs and certain entries I found really impactful as a kid and I still do even as a jaded adult. You might notice that more guest stars populate the show now. Yet, as mentioned earlier, the show really does enjoy casting the oddball character actor, and it's a really nice balance. This season really has a lot of bangers in it and features some of the best practical effects and makeup that still hold up extremely well. 
Season one of Tales from the Crypt was an excellent start and it seemed to understand itself in terms of balance of horror and humor. Season two took some of those growing pains and corrected them. Season two was great, but it had its own stumbling blocks. However, if I had to pinpoint where the series really started to hit its stride in creativity, it would be the third season. Sure, it has its issues, which I will get into, but I think overall it's where the show takes the insanity up an entirely new level and things would only get better until things sort of dropped off in the final two seasons. More on that later. I was a bit worried since the first episode, Love to Death, didn't really wow me and frankly it was an episode I didn't really recall making an impression on me when I first got into the series. Brat Packer Andrew McCarthy plays a screenwriter slash sex pest named Edward, who is what we now would call a nice guy. He is in lust with his neighbor, played by Mariel Hemingway. Also, in case you're wondering, yes, she is related to Ernest Hemingway. She, at every turn, tells him to fuck off. But of course, Edward won't take a hint and uses a love potion to trick her into loving him, which is all kinds of yikes. But of course, in normal crypt fashion, he doesn't get the intended outcome. This is an episode that is just okay and would have been bad, in my opinion, had it not been for a fantastic finale. I'll be totally candid with y'all. Nothing personal with McCarthy, but his entire vibe here is I just wanted to punch him in the face, even when he wasn't doing anything gross. But I digress. <laughs> It also sports an amazingly small but awesome supporting cast, including Kathleen Freeman and genre icon David Hemmings in a late in his career performance. Carrie and Death finds a sadistic killer played by Kyle McLaughlin on the run in the desert. And after him is a nearly unstoppable lawman hot on his heels. So I do recall this one as a kid thinking it was pretty forgettable, but as an adult, I totally love it. It's a slow burn of an episode, but it's by no means boring. This stripped to the bones cat and mouse thriller feels like a play in the best sense, allowing particularly McLaughlin to basically be a one man show as the cop credited only as policeman doesn't really have a lot of lines and things just seem to get progressively worse. And I love that there is this kind of specter of death in the form of a vulture, which is played up to really comedic effect, but doesn't pack the finale. It's not as flashy as the other episodes, but it's still tense, darkly funny, and wow, it's such a really satisfying finale. When a cruel joke from his brother prevents him from becoming a world-class surgeon, Dr. Fairbanks is hell-bent on revenge. When I think of crypt episodes that really freak me out, it's not the ones that are ultra gory or even traditionally scary like those featuring the undead or various monsters. No, it's the episodes that truly take a haunting concept that is maybe more cerebral and executes them with clinical precision. Abracadaver takes the sleep paralysis concept that is already scary, but takes it a twisted step further. What if you were dead, but could still feel and move? It's a painfully basic premise, yet director Stephen Hopkins works his magic to make things as terrifying as possible. What is truly clever is how this concept is conveyed. Namely, we get this extremely effective first person POV with voiceovers that put you literally in the shoes of this poor guy. It's so uncomfortable and also gives you this existential dread that makes it top tier Tales from the Crypt. Easel Kill Ya is an episode that really spoke to me as someone who, even at an early age, was interested in art and making it. It was also my first exposure to the works of Francis Bacon, which is among my favorite artists. The plot centers around painter Jack Craig, who gains himself a wealthy patron when he sells him a morbid painting, which would be fine, though it was produced via accidentally killing someone. Now, in order to please his patron, the body count needs to grow. 
This episode was a fun one to revisit. Despite some cheesy dialogue, this episode holds up extremely well. Outside of the humor, the biggest thing this has going for it is exploring this link between creation and death. This theme is explored in earnest without ever feeling pretentious. And I think it adds a layer outside of the fun gore and swollen tongue in cheek aspects. Speaking of which, in typical crypt fashion, the grim subject matter such as addiction, abuse, and murder is smoothed out with some dark comedy. This mixture produces the perfect shade of blood red goodness and the brush strokes of genius, including Tim Roth in the lead, are on full display. Speaking of which, holy crap, Roth is so great in this. He knows how to not underplay or overplay things, and the nuances he brings to his character really does go a long way. Also, if you enjoy this, there's an excellent Herschel Gordon Lewis movie called Color Me Blood Red, or Roger Corman's A Bucket of Blood, which makes a fun companion piece to this episode. Yellow is the second highest rated episode in this series, and for good reason. The year is 1918 during World War I. It's the 49th day of continuous battle on the front lines. A young lieutenant doesn't want to be in the army anymore and asks his general father for a discharge. His father refuses, but says he will transfer him to the rear if he leads a patrol to the German lines and fix the broken communication line. When he proves himself to be a coward, his father dishes out justice in the form of a firing squad, but may have a trick up his sleeve to get him out of it. Producer Robert Zemeckis only directed a small number of Crypt episodes, and when he did, wow, they are generally speaking pretty great. Tonally, this is something different from anything Crypt has done before or after. It doesn't have the normal dark humor and plays everything very serious, yet the icy grip of misery and death hangs over the entire runtime. It's a gut punch of an episode, and frankly, it's one that I still think about long after I watched it for this review. Another interesting and bittersweet aspect is Kirk Douglas and his son, Eric Douglas, starring together. Sadly, Eric died of an accidental overdose, which adds a extra haunting layer over everything. The acting is great and father and son work off each other really nicely. Lance Hendrickson is back and is great as ever, even with his limited screen time. I also love seeing Dan Aykroyd in a small but serious role. I won't spoil the ending on this one, but damn, it's unforgettable. Now let's talk some honorable mentions. Undertaking Parlor is a weird one, and it centers around kids, much like last season, The Secret did. And thus far, this may be the most disturbing episode. Like, holy crap. While the humor is very much here, there's no getting around the fact that this episode involves, let's just say, carnal relations with the undead. But even outside of that, it's the way it's fetishized that adds an extra layer of it. Not to mention it features nudity, which, believe it or not, we haven't really seen that much of in the series thus far. Sure, there's a lot of sex, but 99% of the time, the show takes great pains in subtly hiding any body parts. But not this one, a naked female body that's being prepared for, let's just say, fun, is really something. John Glover as the insane morgue worker is brilliant and his manic performance helps soften some of the more unnerving elements. Speaking of actors, the kids in this are great. Their dialogue and interaction feel for the most part very authentic. Morning Mess is an episode that talks about persons this house and does it in a really interesting way. Spoiled was nearly a perfect episode and leaned heavily into a very campy soap opera territory but pacing ruined any kind of fun mind from this premise and split second felt very generic until a wonderfully bonkers finale top billing is such a fun outing and seeing john lovitz and john astin acting together is pure joy 
Season three is interesting as it does up the sex. And as I mentioned above, we do get a little bit more overt nudity where in the previous two seasons, it's mainly just teeth. The addition of kids in undertaking is interesting as it feels like despite the sex, the show is courting the 14 and up demo. Overall, this is a really excellent season. And while thinking about episodes, I wanted to spotlight and also honorably mention it was frankly hard as hell to pick. There really isn't any outright horrible episode, even with some of the weaker ones like Dead Weight, which again, on some level is still pretty enjoyable. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you haven't seen my first part, please check it out. I'll link in the description. It might take me a little bit of time to get the third part out, but please stick with me because I'm having a lot of fun uh, rewatching these and reviewing it. So I hope you do too. While you're sticking around, please check out these other videos and I'll see y'all in the next one.